so far throughout the day, what you've, uh, what you've heard is mostly about the what, mostly about the software, mostly about what AGL produces. Today, we're going to learn a little bit about the how, how it's produced. Mm -hmm. So this is basically what the talk is about. And we're going to learn about how it's produced by looking at the data. All right. So let's start with who we are. My name is Agustin Benito. Uh, one of the things I do is I help companies uh, to uh, optimize their investment and their time and their efficiency in open source. And the other thing I do is help companies to optimize their delivery process. And that second topic is what brought me here. Yep, yeah, um, my name is uh, Daniel Izquierdo. Um, I come from academia, so I co-founded Viterdia, which is a development analytics company. Then I'm uh, president of the Inner Source Commons Foundation. I'm working in a couple of extra communities as Chaos. It's community health analytics for open source software. Um, so let's go. Well, this is about the company. Uh, we, you, can, you can learn about this later. So why are we here? So basically, uh, this guy here is bringing a lot of expertise into uh, automotive, embedded systems, and so on. And me, in my case, I'm, we in Viterdia, basically, we are experts in contextualizing data. So what does it mean, basically? Uh, because we can gather all this data for, from publicly available data sources and internally at large corporations, you know, the usual uh, tools that you might be using internally from Jira to GitLab and uh, others. Uh, basically, it's about bringing both worlds together. What is what we can learn from data that can be applied in software-defined products. Um, so we, we are here to discuss and open the box on the data analytics journey. So what, what does it mean? Um, so if you think about the automotive industry, uh, there is business intelligence at almost any level. So this means manufacturing, this means marketing, this means sales, this means after sales processes, this means all the places. But the, one of the key places that this is not happening, although we see that this is now kind of growing, is in, so, in the software production chain. So basically, we don't have business intelligence in how software is produced and then see hardware and software, software defined products in automotive industry. So this is, this is why we are here and having this, this conversation with you. Um, so basically, uh, we, need, we, we are bringing this data-driven approach and then we are focusing specifically on AGL just to learn. So this should be, at the end of the journey, kind of a prescript, prescript, prescriptive process. So basically, there are rules that are based on, on you know, uh, processes that we all learn, and then you can apply them, and then you say, this is happening. So then we can produce stuff properly. But nowadays, we are still in previous stages. We are still describing the problem. We are still understanding what's going on. So this is, this is the data we are, we are bringing here. So, and we believe that this business intelligence should be part of the software process, basically. Because if we have business intelligence and at, you know, in all of these levels, manufacturing and all of this, why not in software? And the problem here that we are facing in the automotive industry is that this is becoming more and more complex. You know, all the hierarchy, all the tier one, tier two, everything is simply becoming more complex. So we need data, basically, to scale, to go to all the, all the product lines, to go to all of the, all of the uh, delivery processes. So this is where we are at, basically. Um, and why this? Basically, because first of all, again, we are describing the problem nowadays. So we need business intelligence to reach this level of uh, prescription, basically, to have prescriptive analysis. The second one is basically we want to support improvements based on data. And we want to uh, scale in involving everyone in the, basically in the company. That means from developers, so the developers can basically ingest, can use the data for something meaningful, to chief level for reporting and so on and so forth. Um, we want to complement existing metrics frameworks, basically by bringing this data-driven approach, right? So uh, some of the frameworks are based on uh, surveys and going and scaling at surveys level. We want to bring this data to, uh, to the discussion as well. And ideally, the problem, the problem that we are facing or we are seeing nowadays in some companies is that uh, we are gathering data from the general level, so from the high level, basically running these surveys to developers or managers, and then we are acting locally. 
So that means that we are going into each of the product lines and adding specific policies. Then any change or improvement that is happening, we are able to gather data again from service perspective globally. With data, we are able to go into the project level and local level, so then we can apply a specific policy and then we can measure actually if the changes, you know, the, the, the expectations are happening in the right direction. So this is where, by bringing this data discussion to you, is where we see there is a lot of value to improve, to act globally and measure globally, uh, act globally and measure globally, act locally and measure locally, basically. And then finally, we want to have this holistic view. We want to go for product lines, production. Uh, we want to go and discuss at the level of people, from chief level to developers. And then we want to discuss uh, with business, basically, to have this data available to all these uh, three, three lines. Um, so again, this is, this is a journey. And then specifically, the journey that we see is this one. So we are, first of all, kind of from the two first boxes on the left. We are first gathering data, so you know again going to the development repositories, so you know who is doing what, when, and where, because you have access to the commit history, for instance. Uh, then we are describing. So basically, the second box is we are we are doing a descriptive and descriptive, descriptive analysis. So basically, what's happening here or what happened in the past. Then we go into the diagnostic. So why this happened? If you have fever, basically that happened because some reason. So this is the diagnosis. And then we are now slowly entering into the predictive analysis. So we are now building risk model analysis, etc. So if you remember the community I mentioned before, CHAOS, Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software, this is where we are releasing part of this process in terms of description, diagnost di diagnostic, and then the predictive analysis with the creation of specific risk models, uh, in this case for open source, but in, in, other, in other areas as well. Ideally, the journey should finish at the, at the end step, which is a, have a prescription of how we should behave producing software, basically. Um, and then we go into the process itself. Uh, Agustin, if you want to interrupt me any time, just, just let me know. Um, so this is, this is more or less the nine step we have, we have defined. So the first one is about describing the value stream mapping. So what is, what is how you are behaving, the processes, the steps, right? Second is about having a model for this. So you are behaving in a certain way, so we need to characterize this. We need to structure the information. We need to go through all the different steps. And then we need to go into the metric framework definition. So basically, this characterization of the model. Um, OK, we have all the theoretical framework on how to approach the problem. Now we need tools to gather information um, and, and do all the deployment internally in a company or for an open source project. And then basically, the usual transformation of the data, loading the data, et cetera, et cetera. Measurements, visualizations, then quantitative uh, analysis, qualitative analysis, and then basically having a discussion with the people that are producing the software, with the managers, and have interviews and surveys perhaps, but with data. So, you know, we have data, something is happening here, why is this happening? So then we can point to different places. Again, this is about bringing data to a specific context. Um, finally, it's about improving, basically. So if we see bottlenecks, if we see problems, what is what we can learn? What is what we can do? Um, OK, now we enter into visualizations. So that is a process that we usually go through in commercial environments, in, in automotive companies. And what we are going to do, what we have been doing, <clears throat> and we're going to continue to do in the following month, is trying to apply that and customize that uh, to apply it to AGL for a variety of reasons. First of all, it allows us to validate what we are doing, and then it allows us also to learn. Uh, we have the luxury of having an open source project that creates an in-vehicle platform uh, so with a structure delivery process. So what we are doing is gathering the data and try to uh, learn about how the software is produced, how AGL uh, products are produced. And AGL has, I, talk, I mentioned, a structured process. It does testing on hardware. This is distributed. It uses, the AGL uses tools that are pretty popular. Um, it is, you know, it's, it's 
there are several roles, so it's a structure. People are also structuring roles, what they can and cannot do in the shared infrastructure. Uh, they produce, uh, they have different um, variants. They have a development, uh, a development code base, and then they stabilize the code base and they release it, and then they do backports. I mean, they do a lot of things that conceptually uh, are done also in automotive environments. So it's a, it's a good learning environment. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to go through the process just very quickly to see, to say some of the things that, that we are doing. And then uh, at some point, hopefully, we were aiming to do it this year. Not sure we're going to make it early next year. At some point, there will be a report with all these. Uh, uh, with, with all these findings, all these process, all these uh, outputs. And don't worry, the, the slide deck will be available. And at some point, uh, hopefully in just a few weeks, we will make available also all the, all the graphs and so you can actually play with them. Okay, the first thing you need to do is to describe the delivery process. If you go to an automotive company, you should have documentation that clearly describes the process. And usually, uh, the way uh, uh, you approach this is through this technical value, uh, value stream map, right? Uh, um, the idea there is just have an overview of the lead time, and so you can just describe the process and also detect where are the areas where you might have inefficiencies, right, or waste. Uh, so this is a description of the AGL delivery process. And we don't have the times here, but well, it's, uh, it's not critical at this point. We will gather them with data. The second thing that we do once we describe the process is we model it. And this is a very, very important step because the, um, we will describe the model through metrics and we will gather data to uh, validate those metrics. So if the model is incorrect, then probably the rest will, will be incorrect. Right now, this is a description of the model and this is one of the things I would like to discuss with you, uh, hopefully tomorrow, uh, because there are several options for the model. Uh, and we need to we need to nail it. Now we feel confident that we have learned enough to actually uh, be able to make uh, put uh, proposals. This is the model that we start with back in June. Now it's not the model that uh, is going to end up with, but most of the data that we have gathered so far are based in this model. Basically, this model has. Uh, commit stage, an integration state, a validation, and verification, and the release. Uh, the actual model is a little bit simpler than this. Uh, for who of, uh, how many of you are familiar or are contributors to AGL? Can you raise your hand? <coughs> Only one? OK, so the rest are not contributors. All right. So you know, here you have some, some, the, some of the tools that AGL use, Garrett and Jenkins with Bitbake, Lava, and then the pink is manual, uh, manual um, processes. So this is nothing but, you know, there is a commit, and then we have a pre-commit, uh, pre-merge stage, build, deploy, test, then there is a, a manual review, and then finally there is a decision, works or not, you rebase it, and so on. Okay, so it's, Nothing but go step by step, trying to figure out uh, how is the process. You and your companies do it too. And then here we have different roles and teams that has assigned different responsibilities. So some of the responsible for these activities are these people, right? AGL dev, committers, then we have a, we have called it release team. It's not probably the, the best uh, name. We will change it. And then finally, the release manager, which is back there, is the one that does this final stage here, right? Remember that the release, releasing software in many industries like automotive is a business decision. It's not a product or a technical decision. All right, we move on. You know, there's always a risk when using data, right? And it's that you focus too much in data. That's what we like to call, instead of uh, data-driven, data-supported, right? It's, uh, the data is a tool. It's a great tool. 
but it's nothing but a tool. This, the following step that we do is define which metrics are we going to use to describe our model and, how we disc and, and then we have to define those metrics. In this case for AGL, we are using very, very, very simple metrics. Uh, we do this the same in, in, in commercial environments. We start extremely simple. If we cannot describe a complex system, applying system thinking with uh, very simple metrics, it's impossible to uh, be confident in describing a complex system with complex metrics. So we have to start simple. Okay, here is the, the matrix that we have, and we have uh, the two delivery process performance metrics. You probably have heard about DORA metrics. Well, DORA nowadays is not exactly these metrics, but back in 2016, 2017, they had this uh, stability and throughput, and we have here what a stability and throughputs are. Ch uh, the stability is measured by uh, your change failure rate, mm -hmm. so the percentage of successes versus failure. You know, when your code flows through the delivery process, at some point there might be a, um, an error or a a build failure or a test failure, whatever. That's so you you measure how many of your commits or your packages of software goes entirely through your process versus which ones do not go. That's a change failure rate. Then you have the failure recovery time. When something goes wrong, how long it takes from the moment that it goes wrong until the next software goes through your process and uh, in a, is successful. That's what this measure means. And then you have throughput. Throughput is lead time. That's the time that takes for a code to flow throughout your entire delivery process. And then the frequency, right? How many uh, packages or commits of code uh, per time gets into your system and gets out of your system. Because frequency is the inverse of time, and when we are managing uh, uh, data sets, we have to deal with errors. We don't want to be uh, managing the inverse of anything. So we use time interval instead as a metric. What other metrics we use? Well, simple ones. In open source, uh, unlike commercial environments, uh, you have to measure always the activity because uh, people do not work eight hours a day every day in your project, right? And that changed completely the kind of measurements and the kind of uh, study that we do. In a commercial environment, you, you start with a fixed number of developers and you assume that they work basically 40 hours a week, if not more. So you have a you, you can you can assume a stable activity not here in an open source project this is a very very important difference between doing this for open source project versus doing it for uh, commercial environments and finally we're going to also look into events in this case product kind of events and organizational kind of events for AGL product events are very simple are going to be releases and organizational events for AGL, it's very important, certain events and certain workshops throughout the year. So we're going to consider those. As you can see, everything is very, very simple. So the most common uh, delivery process performance metrics, two of them, which has, they are stability throughput, and then each one of them has two measures, and then uh, activity measuring number of commits or number of hashes that we change that are changed and then these two events so those are the the metrics that we are using here they are described what i've been saying here is formally described so you can see them in the slides let's move on and then we arrive to the data part gathering the data and the tool oh uh, i have i have one very quickly eh? this should work uh, yeah, so uh, again, so this is based on Grimoire Lab. Uh, Grimoire Lab has uh, been developing uh, chaos projects, so can community health analytics for open source software. You can take it and you can try it internally. So it supports uh, 30 plus different data sources, and there are out of the box 70 plus different dashboards. So it's basically uh, the usual ETL process in terms of gathering data, transforming data, loading data. Uh, go for it. Yeah, so, and for AGL, mm -hmm. 
they have Git repos, Garrett and Jenkins. Those are supported by by uh, the tool. So we are following a very standard ETL process with this open source tool that uh, Viterja uh, is one of the developers. So one of the maintainers of the tool. So nothing for those of you who are data engineers, again, very simple. All right, let's go. Let's move on. Is that working? I can. No, no, it's my fault. OK. So this is um, after we have we gather all the data and we process all the data, the next step is uh, um, making the data consumable to human beings. In this case, we move the data from the data, the responsibility from the data engineers to the consultants. So what we do and what we want are visualizations, tables, basically tables and visualizations, very simple so everybody can understand them, nothing fancy. And this is just a, a table with all the visualizations that we usually work with when we work with this. Here you, we have the metrics here. Then here we have the products that uh, AGL that we're gonna study in AGL, basically meta AGL demo and meta AGL. We are also taking a look for specific things at AGL repo. We're gonna improve. We're gonna increase this with a couple more, but so far those. And and then we are making um, visualizations of the whole delivery process, and then of these two stages. So the verification stage, we are just uh, we just gathered the, dat the data last week, so we will be working on the visualizations after the event and the analysis. So out of the four, five stages that we mentioned in the model, we are f we have the data and made some analysis in two. All right, and. The interesting idea that I want you to get out of, of the take, take away of this event, of this talk, is that uh, it looks very complicated. And underneath it might be, but it has to be very simple for anyone consuming the data, the consultants, but also the developers involved. I think that the, the most um, uh, interesting approach that we are taking and is that data are not only for managers, data is not only for tech leads or for executive, right? Everyone should be able to grasp, the, to grasp uh, the data and create metrics or somebody create metrics for them so they know if they are improving or not based on what the data tells them among other uh, uh, knowledge sources. All right, so the first thing that we take a look was the activity. And well, this is just a graph and a table showing the activity. Why do we do this? We do this because uh, there are, we will see behaviors in the delivery process that might be explained um, based on the activity. When there are more people contributing or less people contributing. Hmm? When there are no people contributing because everybody is in, in on Christmas or something, right? Or on vacation. Okay, so we took a look at the, this is all the repos uh, activity. And these are the kind of uh, graphs that we, we got from the delivery process. Uh, the first two graphs correspond to the throughput. This is the lead time of the delivery process. This is the time interval, the inverse of the frequency. This tell us if the, how much code and how fast is going through the delivery process. And then we have the failure recovery time and the failure rate that provide us an idea of how stable our processes are when the code goes through it. So we are looking at the delivery process as if, if it is a black box and we look at the beginning, we look at the end and we can say a lot of things about the, how the process is working. So, Again, it's a very simple approach. And here, before all this is meta AGL, and we just show uh, a couple of graphs of uh, AGL demo. And you see, the first thing that caught the attention is how different the behaviors are. Is 
a lot of the people are the same working in both. The tools are the same. The processes are almost the same. And the behavior of the system is completely different because the kind of product is different and how the people work on it is completely different. So the, da the data tell us that the behavior of the delivery process is completely different for, from MetaGL than from AGL demo. All right. And then after taking a look at the, the delivery process as a whole, where the model says that the delivery process was divided into four stages. So what we are going to do, remember commit stage, integration, valid five, sorry, validation, verification, and release. Release, we're gonna leave it aside because it's basically a manual process right now. But you have four uh, stages. So now what we are going to do is the same metrics, we are going to apply them to each one of those stages. The good thing about selecting the metrics that we did and the specific metrics that we use is that they are the same for the stages than for the entire process. And you measure them exactly the same way. And you can study them the same way. So if you focus on one for in a local change, you can see the behavior at a global change and you can make the relation. That's why the, the, the metrics has to be simple enough, but they need to have this characteristic that you can apply them to the entire process, but also to different parts of the process. So this is the behavior of meta-AGL, the delivery process of meta-AGL at the integration stage. And for example, here is the other stage, the validation stage, it's also meta-AGL. Okay, so this is the, the, first, the visualization. We visualize these metrics throughout the entire process and then we visualize the metrics for each stage. We have in this case two products, meta-AGL and meta-AGL demo. So we, we separate that. As you can see, if we apply two metrics, four measurements times two products, times four stages, you see the matrix grows and grows and grows. So you have to be really careful and be really, really uh, put effort to just use the metrics that are really meaningful because the matrix, the amount of data and visualizations, uh, you can really drown into information, right? Okay, so what kind of analysis we do, for example, an interesting one. We were we were um, analyzing meta AGL uh, and we present very early results in AGL AMM 2024 summer in Berlin in July, and suddenly we update the information and this, the the system is going absolutely wild the last month and a half, absolutely wild, to the point in which we are seeing some exponential growth on some of these metrics. There is something going on. So before getting into why the system gets so funky and so unstable, the delivery process, the last month and a half, the, the thing that I want you to, to, to see is that imagine a big corporation like the ones some of you work that has several hundred of developers. By the time that the system get in a very unstable situation, by the time usually the, the, the managers see that when there is a fire, right? If you have very smart people in the right time, in the right position, maybe only when there is a smoke, you see that something goes wrong. With these kind of approaches, you can actually understand that things are getting out of normal significantly sooner, in a few weeks time. For some of the problems that you guys face on a daily basis, usually it takes months to actually see that something is going on and it's affecting, impacting the entire delivery process of a product, right? With data, we are advancing that for uh, to a matter of weeks. So this is just an example. In July, everything, when we presented the data, everything was right, and now there is some behavior that needs attention. We don't know what it is, but the data shows here that for meta AGL, the lead time is significantly increasing in the last two or three months. And when we change the period, 
you can get into more detail of what's going on. There's, there's something going on around this date, something. And when you see these kind of behaviors that are so um, steep, usually is a, an external factor affecting the system itself. A system that is pretty stable do not get unstable for no reason. Usually it's the underlying system that that system relies on is what is causing the problem. This process is based on tools, is based on processes, is based on people. So there's something there that is making the system completely unstable. It's, the delivery process is not the problem, right? It's something else. It can be things like there is hardware broken or there is a big change in the platform that now uh, needs some stabilization. It can be a lot of things. The person that used to do a specific work gets sick or cannot attend the, the duties because it's on an event. It can happen a lot of stuff, right? So, okay, so just an example of the behavior. Here we have more, we dig into it a little bit, and before it was the lead time, now it's the time interval is telling us also that there's something going on. Okay, let's move on. But the same behavior from the last three months, we don't see it in the failure recovery time. So, not every metric show that behavior, which is, it, it tell us a little bit more information about what kind of things can be going on. Okay. And what we did here is we merge all the information from all the repos and, uh, the, and investigate on the change failure rate. And what we are seeing is that over time, and here is, uh, we have here from 20 from January 2022 over time the change failure rate is increasing right so that tell us where to put some focus right is the the when you see these kind of metrics over 2 3 4 years and AGL has been around for quite some time so we can really look into the history and find some norm what is normal behavior for these metrics and what is out of normal what we are seeing is that the uh, change failure rate is increasing. So we have more failures on the system. That could be simply that we have more developers or younger developers, or that we are now mm, testing, going uh, into a higher granularity. I mean, it can be, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't need to be bad per se, right? It might be that we are developing a lot of new code and we are trying a lot of new things. We are increasing the number of platforms, that uh, hardware platforms that we are supporting. It can be a lot of stuff. It's, but it's a behavior that needs to be considered and needs to be, uh, we, we need to pay attention. Okay. And what happens for MetaAGL, we don't see it for a, uh, MetaAGL demo, which is also interesting, right? So. It's not the underlying system doesn't seem to be broken because if it would be something like a machine now is degraded or something like that, we would see a, be a general behavior, a general trend in the in the metrics. Okay, we are we are almost finishing. Another of the things we do is. Uh, you know, the, uh, the software is made by people, and we have some metrics. We talk about the events, and here we see. The delivery process, the entire delivery process, lead time, remember that the lead time is the time that the code takes to go throughout the delivery process. And you see some patterns, right? The green, the green uh, line is the medium of, you know, you measure all this, the packages and you take the median. And the blue line is the 75 percentile. So you get, with those two, you get a, an idea of the standard deviation of how spread are the data set, the data points of the data set, and, or how concentrated they are. When the, these two curves are very separate, the, datas, the data points are very separate too. When those two lines are getting together, the data points are very concentrated. And you see some patterns here, right? And then you see patterns here. And usually when you see patterns, they have some kind of explanation. And one of the explanations could be product events, like releases. So we put here the releases, 
and we try to find out if there are patterns. Because this is very interesting because in the next release, unless you change something or something change, you should see the same pattern, right? And then here, uh, this is a three month period, so we measure every three months, and here we measure every six months, and here we measure every, every year. As you can see, by the way, the lead time in AGL is uh, getting uh, smaller uh, over time, which is very interesting, right? Because over time you develop more code, you test more code, but the lead time is going not down. That means that the people, uh, you know, this is a this is kind of situation that everyone wants to see in a company. That despite producing more software and maintaining more software, your lead time is going down. That's the dream of every single executive or manager. AGL has it. Um, all right. And now what we're doing is the same study that we did before. Now we compare it with the activity to see if these patterns can be somehow, uh, there is a correlation between these two graphs. And what we are seeing, we are stay, uh, still in early analysis, but what we are seeing is that there is no correlation. And this is surprising to us. We were expecting some kind of correlation between the behavior of the lead time of the delivery process and the activity. We were expecting that the more developers jump in and the more code is uh, committed, the longer would be the lead time at some point and then everybody would stabilize it. But it's not what it shows. So this is a kind of situation in which we keep digging. All right, maybe now it's the activity of only meta AGL because it's, this is only meta AGL. Uh-uh, we don't see correlation. This is the kind of things we do, okay? All right. And then we put some conclusions here. I put some numbers there so you can look at it if you are interested. Huh? The, and I put in orange these uh, numbers because it doesn't make sense to us, so we have to dig more into them. We have to find out why. But some interesting, very interesting data points here. The lead time is between 19 and 43 hours roughly between one day and two days as, uh, as a median, right? That is fairly good. If you think that you are testing the software on hardware, that you are fully distributed, and you are producing a build that you can download, that is fairly good. It's true that we have to add the next phase, and the next phase will increase these numbers significantly. Still, three days, two, three days for an open source project, it's, it's very good. Very, very good. It's hard to see these numbers in commercial environments. When, as soon as you have to test on hardware or make builds of operating systems, these numbers usually go significantly higher. All right. This is a description in words of what we see with, uh, with the graphs. Just that. And some questions. You see the graphs. And you start to ask yourself questions. That's what we want, right? We want to ask questions. What happened here? What happened in this period of time? Why, why this trend, we don't see it here? Hmm? This is the kind of questions that we see. And some of the conclusions, well, the first one is, you know, you learn about the system, but you have to be true to, your, to the data, right? Okay, it's, it's very clear that the, the delivery process in AGL is fairly efficient, and fairly, we, we have to tune that into, but let's, let's say it uh, fairly for now. Uh, considering all the, the nature of the, of the delivery process. So when you go to a commercial environment and you say, well, you know, we, we need to improve, we want to improve, then you, you know, there is an environment in the open where we can actually learn a lot from at little scale, but we can learn from. Now, some of the, some of the things that we are, uh, that 
we are, as we learn, we realize that moving into a more infrastructure as a code would allow the, the system to be easier to, to learn and easier to understand. And we know in open source that if you lower the barrier, that means that uh, different kind of contributors might jump in. And also, um, so that, that's one of the, uh, the things. And then another interesting point that I'm going to make now, and I'm going to finish with this, yes, I'm going to leave it here, okay, I'm going to stop here, is um, y when you go to the literature about this kind of studies, 99% of what you see out there is uh, based on studies made in cloud environments, so cloud only or cloud first environments, not in embedded environments. So one of the challenges that we are facing is how do we translate all that knowledge, general knowledge, into embedded environments. And uh, that's one of the reasons w that we are doing this. We want to see if the formal knowledge that is out there about uh, applying uh, business intelligence to software production, how does they apply into embedded environments? And I'm going to leave it here. Uh, you have a little bit more information of some conclusions and some recommendations. These are early recommendations. Don't take it as anything def definitive. But if you read about them and you want to comment with us, we are willing to learn and take opinions. We might be wrong. We are still. Uh, in a learning phase. Yeah. We'll be here tomorrow, so just yeah. in case you'd like to. So hopefully uh, hopefully uh, we will be able to learn a little a bit more on this event. And uh, in a few couple of months or three, we will be able to publish a nice report about uh, how, how AGL is delivering software. Uh, from the from you know from the eyes of people that are uh, applying these kind of techniques to commercial environments, especially automotive environments. That's it. Any question or any comment? Now everybody wants to eat. <laughs> Me too. Thank you. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. <laughs>